Hello, it's Scott Manley here with another episode of Things That Kerbal Space Program Doesn't Teach You. Today, I kind of want to talk about the plumbing that goes into making the rocket engines work. I mean, rocket engines are really all about the plumbing that takes the fuel from the tanks and into the engines. But anyway, this week we've of course had Elon Musk giving his SpaceX Mars presentation and yeah, a lot of people were super excited about it, the news people loved it, but the real rocket scientists, they were paying more attention to the Raptor engine, which had apparently been tested a couple of days prior to his presentation. Now, Raptor is going to be SpaceX's next generation engine, and the stats, the performance stats that they want to achieve on this thing are amazing. The chamber pressure is going to be 300 bar. The thrust is going to be something like 60% that of an F1. It runs on the fuel of the future, that is, liquid oxygen and liquid methane. And somewhere down in the small print, you might have seen that it's a full flow staged combustion cycle. Now, if you're not a rocket scientist, you probably know what each of those words means on its own. But together, you probably come up with a blank. And that's what this episode is all about. So we're going to rewind and start with something simpler. In Kerbal Space Program, you basically take a fuel and oxidizer engine and you uh, have a, you attach an engine to it and the fuel magically flows into the rocket engine and makes it work. But in reality, you kind of need to make the thing work according to physics. The simplest rocket engines, you have a fuel tank, you have your uh, oxidizer tank and you just pressurize them with uh, some gas. Typically, it's an inert gas like uh, nitrogen or helium. Helium is by far the most common. And if the pr gas pressure is high enough, it forces the fuel out off the bottom of the tank through the plumbing and into the engine. Depending upon the design, you may have a pressurant tank which has to perhaps run its fuel over a heat exchanger around, around the engine to replenish the pressure that's lost, or sorry, as more space comes into the tank, you need to fill it up with more pressurizing fluid. But really, it's a very, very simple process. And uh, turning these engines on typically is done by just opening a bunch of valves and then closing a bunch of valves, especially if the fuel and oxidizer are hypergolic. Pressure-fed engines are used whenever you need engines to be really reliable and always work. They're used in reaction control thrusters. The Apollo, uh, all the Apollo lander engines, the uh, AJ-10 upper stage, or, and uh, the maneuvering engines, or orbital maneuvering system on the space shuttle. Very, very simple, but it has its limits. One of the things about this is if you want to get high thrust, you need to have high chamber pressures. If you want high chamber pressures, it means you need high fuel pressures, and that means you need high tank pressures. And if you want high tank pressures, you need to have very, very strong tanks, otherwise the tanks will burn, burst. If you want to know what happens when a fuel tank bursts, take a look at the two SpaceX failures. Uh, although they don't use pressure-fed engines, uh, they still pressure, uh, pressurize their tanks with helium. Anyway, yeah, the more common way to do this is to have a fuel pump which will take the fuel from the tank at relatively low pressure and then pressurize it and push it into the engine. So the high pressure area is only around the fuel pump and you don't need super heavy tanks. So the typical type of pumps used are something called turbo pumps. These kind of use spiral structures which look like kind of weird alien mollusk shells or I don't know they, they look really cool when you see them the way they work. Uh, these are actually used in fire engines as well but uh, you know how do you drive these is really the next question because you need a lot of power to drive this to get the fuel to come through it as quickly as possible. And actually if you look at a, an in-development rocket, a small rocket called the Electron, its engine is called the Rutherford engine and that is rather unique because the fuel pumps in that are powered by electric motors, 50 horsepower electric motors driven by batteries and they will take the fuel and push it through into the engine at high enough rates. Similarly, uh, kind of more unconventionally, you might have heard of the Bloodhound, which is a car that's being developed that will supposedly go a thousand miles an hour. Now, it obviously has jet engines uh, and it has a rocket engine, but you may not know that the rocket engine actually has its fuel pumps driven by a regular internal combustion car engine. 
right? Because they need to pump the fuel into the, the peroxide fuel into their rocket cham uh, combustion chamber. But anyway, these are kind of exceptions. Really, if you're building a rocket, you have all these tanks, you want to harness chemical energy. And to do that, you use something called the gas generator cycle. Now, what you do is you have a little combustion chamber, a pre-burner, which is smaller than the main combustion chamber, and you perform some sort of chemical reaction which generates gas. That gas then gets channeled through a turbine, and a turbine is essentially the reverse of a turbo pump. Uh, so the turbo pump, sorry, the turbine spins, and it's connected by a common shaft to the turbo pump, and therefore your turbo pump spins and pumps fuel and everything works. So in the early days, the V2 and the R7, and right, really the Soyuz, which is descended from the R7, they uh, use hydrogen peroxide where they decompose that over a catalyst. The hydrogen peroxide splits into steam and oxygen. And the pressure from that is driven, used to drive a turbo pump, which then drives the fuel and the oxygen into the main engine. That is still in use today. But really, more commonly these days in modern engines, you realize that if you have a fuel and an oxidizer, you have a way to generate gas without a third type of fuel on hand. So in the Merlin engines, you will basically burn a bit of your fuel with a lot of oxygen. And although you're not burning 100% of your oxygen, you are, you know, so you're not mixing them in perfect ratios to get maximum energy. You are generating a lot of gas pressure and that blows through, drives the turbo pump that then puts the fuel and the oxygen into the engine. The thing about the gas generator engine is what happens after you've generated this gas and driven the turbo pump? Well, what happens is this gas just kind of goes out an exhaust pipe and is lost. And this is fine, it's, it's uh, pretty efficient, but it does represent lost fuel, lost energy. You know, you're using a small amount of your fuel to drive this and then you're losing any thrust it could generate. So, smart rocket scientists have really been working to take that exhaust pipe and kind of divert it back into the main combustion chamber and therefore close the cycle to generate closed cycle engines. Of course, closing the cycle is actually complicated because as soon as you take that exhaust pipe and plug it back into the combustion chamber, the combustion chamber is now exerting pressure back through your turbo pumps, back into your pre-burner. So you need to have your pre-burner generating more energy. You need to generate much closer to the perfect uh, chemical ratio. Therefore, your turbo pump is now getting more stressed. And uh, for a long time, it was thought that this was a very difficult thing to do. So uh, in the case, the Soviets were the first ones to do it and they were able to do fuel, uh, you know, RP-1, kerosene and liquid oxygen engines. And they did it with what's called an oxygen-rich pre-burner. What this means is, yeah, again, you've got slightly more oxygen than kerosene. And the reason you do this is because the turbo pump will disintegrate if it was fed the, the combustion products at the perfect ratio because it would be too hot. But if you back off the amount of fuel, then the gas that's generated is a little cooler. But it is still incredibly hot and it has a lot of oxygen in it and the metallurgy required to make turbo pump impellers that didn't get completely disintegrated by this amount of heat and oxygen was thought to be impossible. Uh, the US actually didn't believe it when they were told that the Russians were using this. Uh, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, uh, the you know, Design Bureau of Russia, they, they were all getting together with the American rocket developers and you know, there was several requests for clarification because the, the engines were far too good according to American expectations. Now, Americans, the, they also built a closed cycle engine that was used on the space shuttle. The space shuttle main engine uses liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. But in their case, it was much easier to do a fuel-rich pre-burner where more hydrogen was put in and oxygen, and then that was used to drive everything. So, um, that worked better. And incidentally, the reason that uh, you have to be careful if you were to do a fuel-rich pre-burner with something like a RP-1, 
The danger in that case is that you can generate soot, which can clog up your works. So that generally doesn't happen. Anyway, it's really hard to build a closed cycle engine, and that, but that is where the best efficiency is. It's really hard to get them started because you need to have all these different valves start opening up in the correct order. You need to have your pre-burners firing up. There's a whole lot of things can, that can go wrong, but they do offer a decent amount of extra performance. Anyway, one other problem that needs to be contended with is you have a fuel-rich or an oxidizer-rich pre-burner, but that shaft, the impeller where the fuel is coming through, or sorry, the gases are running through, there's a shaft that has to drive to the other side of the turbo pump, right? So you've got unburned fuel being driven through one side. Well, along this shaft, it's actually possible for some of the, uh, of the combustion products to sneak along and migrate. So you need some very good seals to stop this happening because if you had, say, your oxygen-rich mixture sneaking through into the fuel side, you could have combustion happening before it hit the combustion chamber and that would be bad. Same is true for a fuel-rich mixture. You don't want that leaking through to an oxidizer-rich side. So the full-flow staged combustion cycle uh, fixes this by having a, an oxygen rich side and a fuel rich pre burner, right? So you have you have two pre burners, one on both sides. They each drive their own turbo pumps. The fuel rich version is used to pump the fuel. The oxygen rich version is used to pump the oxygen, and then they ultimately meet in the engine, and we get explosive rocket happiness. This is great, it means you don't have to worry about your seals anymore, so these engines can last a lot longer, which is going to be incredibly important if you're, say, wanting to repeatedly launch people to Mars on them. So uh, the, the Raptor isn't the first full flow stage combustion engine, incidentally. The Soviets designed one in the innate form of the RD-270, that was part of the, kind of the Soviet moon project, but it was cancelled. And more recently, in the US, they developed something called the Integrated Powerhead Demonstrator. And that was all fine, it performed very well, but after NASA stopped funding the project, the rocket companies didn't feel they had any incentive to continue to pursue it. So it seems very likely that the Raptor will be the first one to actually fly, unless the IPD gets resurrected. So anyway, that explains what a full flow staged combustion cycle is. You've got you know two pre burners with different ratios, and everything works. Um, there's another couple of fuel flow cycles that are worth mentioning. First of all, is the uh, the combustion tap off cycle, and this was used by the BE three rocket on uh, Blue Origin's New Shepard. So. In this case, instead of having a separate pre-burner, you literally have a pipe getting tapped off of the combustion chamber that goes to drive the turbo pumps. You'll probably have some heat exchange to try cooling it down a little because otherwise the turbo pump is in a lot, you know, it's handling, it's handling full, perfectly mixed combustion products at very high temperatures and very high pressures. So that's great that they got that to work. However, it is kind of an open cycle because after that, it does end up flowing out the exhaust pipe and essentially losing thrust. It does remove some moving parts, so that's great. But uh, yeah, it's basically another version of the gas generator cycle. Uh, but the other more interesting one is the expander cycle. So the expander cycle says instead of burning fuel and to make it expand and generate gases, why not just take a liquid gas and then heat it up and then it expands into gaseous form? And an ideal gas for this is liquid hydrogen. So you can feed that around the walls of your uh, rocket engine as it's burning. The heat will boil it off into hydrogen gas and then that hydrogen gas comes off and then it's used to drive the turbo pump that then takes more hydrogen and oxygen and feeds it into the engine. Uh, you know, this is great, it works with cryogenic engines and it's used in the venerable RL10 that of course is part of the Centaur upper stage and, and you know it's, it's amazing, it's a very simple engine and it's been very very reliable. I guess the only downside of this is there's a limit to how powerful you can make this. 
And this simply comes from geometry. So if you imagine your combustion chamber, uh, you know, you want to pump enough fuel in to fill the combustion chamber. So uh, if you increase the size of your combustion chamber, the amount of fuel you need goes as the radius cubed. However, the driving fluid is being heated up in the walls of the chamber and the surface area of your chamber goes as the radius squared. So therefore, the fuel requirements go up as the radius cubed, but the fuel driving availability goes up as the radius squared. Therefore, eventually, at some point, you reach a maximum combustion chamber size at which you can't get any more thrust. And uh, there's people put these at various limits, but nobody is really building big expander cycle engines. So yeah, that more or less explains rocket engine plumbing and what a full flow staged combustion cycle is. There are a few other interesting things in this area, but uh, rocket science really is replete with interesting ideas. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I hope you, can, hope you enjoyed that. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.